okay so uh, let us uh, continue our discussion in this uh, module 5 so today uh, we are going to discuss about formability testing of uh, sheet materials okay so in the previous uh, section uh, we uh, introduced uh, uh, the uh, concept of forming limit curve and uh, what happens during the king process specifically in the uh, you know the uh, biaxial stretching region that is in the first quadrant is what we have seen and uh, we will introduce that again and then uh, we will go ahead and uh, see what are the different formability tests available uh, to estimate the uh, formability or forming limit or deep drawability or stretchability of uh, uh, sheet materials. So, uh, in this model we are going to see only uh, formability testing of uh, sheet metals. So, uh, let us introduce this forming limit curve again. So, what is this forming limit curve? This forming limit curve is nothing but uh, the curve which indicates onset of local necking in both the regions that is uh, in the first quadrant and in the second quadrant and um, it is nothing but the locus of limit strains. We introduced uh, epsilon 1 star comma epsilon 2 star in the previous uh, section and if we get this data for different values of alpha or beta right from let us say on the left hand side extreme to the right extreme if we get so negative minus strain to positive minus strain if we get okay so then if we connect all of them that is nothing but your forming limit curve that is what we have seen. So, in this star whatever I mentioned here are forming limit strains. So, we said that it is a material property. So, unless otherwise you change something in the material, it is not going to change, it will remain same. And uh, we have also seen that uh, it is useful for various reasons. One is uh, you need to get the failure diagnosis of the sheet grades, uh, quality of sheet, if you estimate it, then it will be useful. Okay. So, you want to select a particular material, sheet material for a component, then this will be useful. You want to decide the process conditions like lubrication or lubricants, forming temperature, strain rate, whether it is sufficient to form the component, then this forming limit curve can be used. So, before we understand the uh, different methods of uh, formability uh, evaluation, uh, you know, procedures, okay. So, because we introduced forming limit curve, let us discuss one or two important methods uh, through which we can evaluate a forming limit curve. So, let us discuss that then we will go ahead in discussing about other formability tests. So, that is why I given a topic today is so FLC evaluation, forming limit curve evaluation and other formability tests. So, uh, forming limit curve or formability I think we understand the meaning of that it is nothing but the ability of the sheet material to uh, get converted into a particular shape without any instability without any necking in that without fracture that is the meaning and forming limit curve can be used to evaluate that. So, uh, one important method procedure or test uh, to evaluate forming limit curve of any sheet material is called hemispherical dome test. It is all, it can also be called as limiting dome height test. So, hemispherical dome test as the name suggests you are going to have a punch okay which is of hemispherical in shape okay and uh, so naturally there are tools available for that. Okay, so, you can install the tools and then you can deform the sheet with the help of you know punch setup and then you keep deforming the material the sheet as per the procedure that we are going to describe until necking occurs or fractures whatever is possible for us to stop we will do that. Okay, so, then it is called as a limiting dome height test. So, you are going to get a dome shape and uh, that will be limited because of formability of the material. So, you call that as limiting dome height test. Okay. So, in short it is called as a LDH test. So, it is an evaluation procedure or test for metal sheet deformation capability using an experimental setup having a hemispherical punch deforming a sheet with circumferential clamping force sufficient to prevent it from sliding or pulled into the die cavity. So, we will uh, see that. So, in this test procedure, the procedure is actually very simple. Okay, It is not that very complex. So, you keep the sheet, you hold the sheet okay, with the blank holder. Okay, So, you keep the sheet on the die, you use a blank holder and hold it and then punch will come separately 
and push the sheet inside the die cavity until necking happens or fracture happens. And then you take the sheet out and you measure the epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 near neck region that becomes a one point in this particular curve. Okay, that becomes a one point in this particular curve. So, like this, you uh, change a strain path by one particular way. You change a strain path betas, predefined strain paths, predefined betas. Okay, that is why we say beta. You can imagine why it is predefined because it is alpha naught and beta naught, we said, isn't it? So, during the course of deformation, during the king, it can change, but it is a predefined strain path, okay. you get the limit strains in other uh, betas. So, by the changing the strain path. So, the procedure is very simple okay. and uh, in, a, in one sentence, you can tell the entire procedure in this way. Okay. So, uh, one important issue here is the sheet generally should not slide inside. Okay. So, sheet has to actually stretch below the punch, that is the main thing here that is why you mentioned that with the circumferential clamping force or blank holding force you can say sufficient to prevent the sheet from sliding or pulled into the die cavity. It should not draw in, it should not be pulled in. So, it has to be clamped tightly like that. Okay. So, this is nothing but a procedure for constructing forming limit curve of a metallic sheet by using a hemispherical deforming punch. Okay. And generally this test is available for, for all sheets which has got uh, this particular thickness of the order of this 0 0.5 to 3 mm thickness. Okay. So, before we do that, there are some important definitions I thought it will be useful for us. One is a forming limit curve, we call it as FLC. It is a curve showing the strain levels beyond which localized necking or localized through thickness thinning. Through thickness thinning is nothing but necking. Through thickness thinning means epsilon 3, epsilon 3. Okay. Whatever we discussed until now, it is nothing but epsilon 3. This epsilon 3 is very important. It should not go beyond a particular limit. So, otherwise necking will happen. It is also called as necking. And subsequent fracture occur during the forming of a metallic sheet. Okay. So, it will show the strain levels. So, this forming limit curve can be shown in this way. Okay. The same figure which I have shown before, but I just shown in a different way. So, you can see that you can have different betas 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, I just indicated different stars to get the limit strains and you can see that these all are deformed and different uh, strain paths. Let us say it is going to be linear, let us assume that way and then all the strain values below this curve are actually safe and once you reach this curve, you are actually in the, uh, in the onset of necking and above that uh, definitely sheet is going to fail. So, that is the meaning. This is called the forming limit curve. So, the next important definition is called as a forming limit diagram. It is called as forming uh, FLD in short. Okay. It is a graph in which uh, experimentally measured major strain okay, and minor strain combinations are plotted to develop FLC. So, basically epsilon 1 star and epsilon 2 star, we call it as limit strains, is not it? So, you want to get that practically, experimentally, then there are certain procedures. Okay. While doing that, you have to calculate uh, some strains. Okay. So, it is a graph in which experimentally measured major strain, minor strain are plotted in one graph and there is a procedure to develop forming limit curve. So, that entire diagram is called as forming limit diagram. Okay. For example, I have shown forming limit diagram here and forming limit curve here. Both are similar meaning only. Only thing is like this forming limit diagram will include some strain values okay, which will be separated by this forming limit curve in this fashion. You can see that these are all these orange ones, circle ones, this uh, uh, this diamond shape, okay, both are shown here. The orange ones are actually safe strains and these red ones, diamond ones are basically failed strains. That is why I said fail and safe. Okay, And you can see that this curve is actually separating these two data points, these two sets of data points. Okay, So, probably this data points were obtained from one strain path, this is from another strain path and this is from plane strain path, this is from another strain path, this set will be from uh, beta is equal to 1. So, you are going to deform the sheet and you are going to get both safe strains and failed strains and plot all in one okay, to get uh, a curve which is going to separate these two. So, if you plot all the strain values inside this uh, diagram along with forming limit curve, then you call this as forming limit diagram. So, that is the main difference here. So, forming limit diagram is nothing but forming limit curve plus strain values used to uh, separate these two. 
okay so strain wise used to construct forming limit curve so then uh, there are three important modes of deformation we have already seen five different modes but uh, biaxial stretching we know that what do you mean by biaxial stretching it is a mode of deformation in which positive strains both are positive epsilon 1 and 2 both the principal strains are positive are observed in both in plane directions at a given location or a grid location okay so biaxial stretching means uh, epsilon 1 and 2 would be both positive say for example epsilon 1 and 2 both will be positive means all this 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 is red uh, or it could be yellow one all are on this side of the diagram or nothing but uh, your uh, biaxial stretching one case is balanced biaxial stretching where epsilon 1 and 2 are same so which will give you epsilon 2 by 1 as beta is equal to 1 which will be probably an extreme case here okay so deep drawing mode of deformation also we have seen okay is a mode of deformation in which strains on the test specimen surface are positive in direction 1 that is epsilon 1 is positive it is always going to be positive only that is why you have only one y axis epsilon 1 is positive but epsilon 2 can be negative okay epsilon 2 can be negative okay and the negative in 90 degree direction that means along direction 2 which is epsilon 2 so epsilon 2 is actually going to be negative in this case so that uh, this a uh, drawing strain path is going to be on the second quadrant plane strain mode of deformation is also we uh, we know already okay it is a mode of uh, deformation or forming that maintains uh, near 0 minus strain or 0 minus strain so epsilon 2 is uh, 0 suppose epsilon 2 is 0 means this point this entire y axis so you have uh, any limit strain in y axis say for example this point or this red point or this orange points they are actually closer to plane strain so, okay so in this case you will see that uh, there is a positive major strain and it is going to be uh, 0 minus strain okay it is going to be 0 minus strain so minus strain is positive in this side minus strain is 0 on this side minus strain is negative in this side by axial stretching plane strain deep drawing mode of deformation so when we speak about forming limit curve there is one important uh, uh, level in forming limit curve one important data in the forming limit curve okay that uh, generally we take it as a reference that is called fld0 so fld0 is nothing but this particular point okay it is a location on forming limit curve or this particular star the star we say here in plane strain that is nothing but your fld0 okay that is nothing but your fld0 so you can call this as uh, i will write this as fld0 like this it is a location on the forming limit curve that has got the lowest major strain or the limit strain in plane strain mode or the limit strain in plane, plane strain mode is this part. When you go along y axis you are going along plane strain mode of deformation and you will see that whatever limit strain you have that you can call it as FLD0 and that is actually a conservative window for uh, forming sheets. So when you deform a material along plane strain mode of deformation along this you will reach the forming limit curve at the earliest as compared to any other strain path any other beta so you are deforming along a conservative window to reach the limit strains little early as compared to the other two extreme uh, you know strain paths okay so this all are actually uh, drawn schematically uh, schematically here so you see that this is the initial circle grid uh, you know pattern we have in the sheet let us say there are several such circles you can put uh, the circles could be of let us say as small as 2.5 mm sometimes for easy measurement you can have 10 mm also but the smaller the circle we can get accurate strain uh, values at different locations in a sheet okay so uh, we can imagine that uh, there is a particular l naught and w naught of course you can say d naught also we have already seen this d naught okay so i am just mentioning it as l naught and w naught and you will see that in um, a drawing type of uh, deformation so it is going to be uh, your the circle is going to become an ellipse circle is going to become an ellipse with a w width and length is going to increase to this red color one the red color ones are actually deformed circles the black ones are the original circle undeformed ones okay so deep drawing you will see that it is going inside so if you calculate along let us say this is two direction and this is one direction if you calculate strain along two direction so naturally it will come somewhere here so in plane strain mode of deformation you will see that uh, so this dimension is almost the same so when you calculate uh, epsilon 2 here so since the uh, diameter is you know w naught is going to be same as that of w so your uh, strain will be zero but you will have some strain in the uh, one direction so that will be somewhere here let us say and by axial stretching you know that you know uh, circle will become a larger circle and uh, from this w from this l you can get strains w naught l naught is known so you can get strains and you will see that uh, you are going to have uh, 
some data in the positive side. Okay. So, FLC, FLD, biaxial, deep drawing mode of the plane strain and FLD0, these are all certain terms that is uh, generally used with respect to forming limit curve. So, now let us go to uh, one simple test procedure. This test procedure is actually meant for hemispherical dome test or limit dome height test you can say and uh, this is schematic is one standard uh, you know dimensions so one can fabricate in a lab and you can use it to get the forming limit curve or formability of the sheet. So, if you closely look at it, the tools are conventional in nature. Say for example, you have a punch which has got a hemispherical uh, bottom okay, and uh, you have the radius of about 50.8 mm okay, and uh, you will see that uh, uh, this hatched one is actually a sheet which is partially deformed, partially stretched you can say and uh, you will see that uh, to start with the sheet is actually going to be flat. Uh, it is a flat sheet like this. It is a flat sheet like this and punch will be touching the sheet in this fashion to start with and you are displacing the punch in this direction and displacement is provided to punch in this direction. Huh? So, and the sheet is actually stretched and you will see that to avoid the radial movement of your sheet, the sheet is actually locked here by something called as lock bead or draw bead. Okay. And uh, this is actually called a hold down ring or you can also say blank holder and there is a die. Okay. All are uh, circular in nature. Okay, so it's a cylindrical punch. Okay, this uh, blank holder is nothing but a ring. Okay, with a hole at the center. Similarly, die is also it has got a hole at the center. Of course, here it is shown very sharp, but actually there is a corner, die corner. Okay, and your blank holder has go also has got a typical corner radius like this, and you will see that uh, the gap between the die inner walls is about one not five point seven mm, and you can see the lock bead is. Uh, spaced at about 132.6 mm. Now, it is a circular one. So, which means that uh, the sheet is actually clamped uh, circumferentially. That is why it is written the circumferential uh, clamping force is applied using draw bead as well as some blank holding force. Okay. This draw bead if you use, it will avoid the radial movement of the sheet and hence, uh, uh, you know, the sheet is going to stretch below the punch. Okay. So, I have also given here this LDH test setup showing tools, sheet and important dimensions. Okay. So, uh, the, the point here is there are some machines already available okay. or you can install this machine in your UTM okay. or you can uh, use a double action hydraulic press where this type of tools can be installed. Okay. So, if there are some already available machines means the machines are meant only for this kind of experiments. Uh, double action hydraulic press means uh, you know it is a general purpose double action hydraulic press. So, one action is to hold the sheet using blank holder and then a punch will come separately that is a second action okay. and then uh, uh, the sheet will be deformed or sometimes what we do is if I make this setup and uh, the clamping is actually done mechanically using fastener okay. using uh, fasteners you can uh, mechanically clamp the sheet and this uh, punch is actually held in the UTM and uh, like any other test you know your uh, you know the moment of punch is actually controlled by hydraulic means and it will come and deform the sheet. Only thing is in mechanical clamping you have to make sure that uh, the sheet is actually not uh, drying. Okay. So, I have also shown said that uh, the contact surfaces of the raw undeformed sheet and punch are actually uh, lubricated. Okay. The sheet is uh, securely clamped in the flange region using a lock bead or a draw bead here located in the die blank holder arrangement in the die blank holder arrangement for the hemispherical punch and hydraulic press, uh, bulge test. Hydraulic bulge test, what is it? We will see separately, okay. but for hemispherical punch test and or limit dome height test, this is what you do. So, now what we are going to do is, uh, we are going to stretch the central area of the sheet. That means, the sheet below the punch okay, is performed without interrupting the test. You should not stop the test. You continue the test okay, and you are going to do that uh, until necking occurs or fracture occurs. It all depends on how do you identify that. Okay, a series of test samples with grid patterns is prepared with the different widths, but with constant length suitable for clamping. So now, in order to get the forming limit curve, okay, you need to deform the this particular sheet uh, at a different strain paths or beta values, right? That is done in this test just by changing the sheet width. So I will show you that just by changing the sheet width, okay, keeping the length constant, okay, and you use this setup to 
uh, form the sheet until fracture, until necking and you measure the strain grids in the ne near the neck region, okay, you will get the forming limit curve. So, basically a series of, uh, you know, uh, strips of one particular material with the different widths but a constant length will be deformed using this setup to get the forming limit curve, okay. So, that is why, you know, in this diagram, if you see, okay, I mentioned 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So, which means that you can use 7 different widths, okay. You can also use any in-between widths also. If you want to get accurate forming limit curve, in-between some widths also, you can, one can get forming limit curve, okay. One can get limit strains, but uh, let us say about the 7 different widths can be uh, change to get the forming limit strains in that particular strain part, keeping the length constant. But length of the sheet should be such that you will be able to clamp it properly here. Okay, you should be able to clamp it. So that's why length is remaining constant. Width can change. Okay. So if you see this from the top view, if you see this from the top view, whatever I mentioned will look like this. Whatever I mentioned will look like this. Okay, this is just a schematic I mentioned. Okay. Uh, there are two things here. One is uh, this light blue, which is nothing but your sheet. I have written sheet here. Uh, this is also a sheet. This is also a sheet. This red, the circular one is actually a punch, the same punch. Okay. This same punch, which you see from the top view. You see from the top view, the punch will look like uh, the red color circle, let us say. And the sheet are, sheets are of this particular length, which are actually same length you can see. Okay. All the three sheets are of same length. But width is changing. You can see this W is changed. This W is changed as compared to this. Okay. The width is different in all the three cases. I just shown three cases as an example. So, if you see uh, from the top view, how does it look like is uh, in one case, uh, okay, if you want to get limit strain in the negative minus strain region, that is in the second quadrant to start with, that is in the second quadrant. Suppose in this quadrant, okay, if you want limit strain, so what you need to do is uh, you need to have a sheet of width slightly smaller than the punch diameter, okay. So, negative minus strain obtained from narrow strip test specimens with respect to punch, okay. On the other hand, if you want to get positive, uh, you know, minus strain, then this would be suitable. That means uh, your limit strains will be somewhere here in this portion. If you want that, okay, so then you use uh, this type of sheet. The sheet is actually pretty large as compared to the punch dimension. But if you want plain strain, you pick up an in-between width, which is uh, say for example, width is almost same as that of your punch uh, diameter, okay, or maybe slightly uh, lesser than this, slightly lesser than the punch, but larger than this, or slightly larger than the punch, but lesser than this sheet. That is also available, okay. So, uh, if you deform that sheet up to fracture, then you will get uh, limit strains in the zero minus strain, that is plain strain type of deformation, okay. So, in between these two, you may have some width. Let us say two different widths you assume. In between these two, you assume two different widths. So, naturally, if you deform it up to fracture, you will get limit strains in this many number of strain paths. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 different strain paths you can get. Okay. And uh, since uh, you are seeing the top view of that, just for a feel, you will see that the draw bead is actually clamped. The draw bead is used to clamp the sheet somewhere here. You can imagine. Draw bead is used to clamp the sheet somewhere here. Okay sheet is actually, uh, oh, this is this one. So, naturally, this will be, draw bead will be clamped fully like this. The top view will be more clear here. So, draw bead is a circular uh, ring, no? So, you will be, till the sheet will be clamped fully in this uh, blue region, okay? Now, punch will deform it and only this part of the sheet is going to deform, okay? This part of the sheet will not be allowed to draw in, same as that of here. This sheet will not go inside. This will be arrested. Okay, so that is the whole idea of this particular test. So now what we do, the punch displacement is stopped when a localized necking, when a localized necking is visible. Okay, when a localized necking is visible. Maybe you can put a camera, you know, below the sheet and you can find out where necking is going to happen. If it is in UTM, then you can easily visualize it. If it is other press, hydraulic press, industry type press, then one can put a camera and find out. Sometimes what we do is like uh, you can also get load displacement graph during this testing, okay, like our tensile test, no? Here also you can get load displacement graph uh, and you can see that uh, there will be some failure, okay. So probably close to that you have to be very careful that necking might have happened just before that you should have stopped the test around by that time, okay. So if the test is not stopped as soon as test specimen, okay. So if the test is not stopped, it can be tested, it can be stopped when fracture happens. That is also possible, okay. So, uh, 
generally if the sheet preparation is good okay if the sheet the sample preparation is good without any burr or other defects it will not spread across the nose of the punch okay instead when the punch is displayed beyond the sheet forming limit neck or fracture occurs in the ring encircling the round cap of the formed region so what is the the point here is like if, if the sheet preparation is good then it will not fail in the unwanted region like in tensile test you want fracture to happen necking to happen in the gauge region similarly here also you want the fracture to happen somewhere in the deforming region here or here or here okay in the sheet in the sheet or here okay in the sheet if the sheet preparation is good then this problem uh, will will be sorted out if it is bad then it can fail in the gripping region also somewhere in this edge region it can fail especially this is a problem in plain strain mode of deformation so it can fail somewhere in the edge region okay so one has to be little bit uh, careful in that so there are some important points with respect to lubrication so you will see that lubrication improves sliding of sheet over the punch surface and causes material fracture closer to the nose of the punch nose of the punch means uh, what we are saying is uh, you may uh, when you do experiments you will find out that uh, generally if you go for dry lubrication generally your your fracture is going to happen away from the center okay it may happen somewhere here or maybe here okay maybe here or here okay but if you are having lubricants or good lubrication is done generally it moves closer to the no punch nose okay so fracture will happen somewhere here so we are saying that lubrication provides sliding of sheet over the punch surface and causes material fracture closer to the punch nose okay it is but one thing we have to be very clear that it is important to note that this does not change the forming limit generally it is understood that if you put lubricant or you don't put lubricant you deform the sheet in dry condition forming limit will not change your forming limit curve is not going to change this forming limit curve which we mentioned just before okay this forming limit curve is not going to change okay when you use lubricant or you do the test without lubricant that is why we call it as a material property but what it does is it does not change the forming limit as the minor strain epsilon to adjust to the increased major strain if you put lubricant the strain value can change but accordingly epsilon 2 will get adjusted for what are the value of epsilon 1 you have which also means that it indicates change in strain path or strain ratio beta are not forming limit strains actually epsilon 1 star and 2 star that will not change rather what will happen is it will change the root of uh, getting into the forming limit curve okay so it also means that if you put lubricant okay so if you don't put lubricant probably you will reach uh, uh, the forming limit curve somewhere here okay if you put lubricant it will reach the forming limit curve in some other location maybe somewhere here maybe somewhere here but the forming limit curve will remain same forming limit curve will remain same so instead of reaching a forming limit curve here it will reach a forming limit curve here but forming limit curve will remain same only thing is there will be slight change in the limit strain values so that's why it is said that these two strains will get adjusted as a minor strain epsilon to adjust to the increased major strain but it will reach the same forming limit curve of that particular material so now so what did you do so now the step is basically uh, we have done our test up to this particular point the punch displacement is stopped when the localized necking is actually witnessed if it, when it is visible now you have stopped it okay so now you have to measure strain and then you have developed forming limit curve this is very very important because your strain measurement has to be accurate so that your forming limit curve is also going to be accurate if there is approximation in strain evaluation then there will be problem in the forming limit curve that is why we said that in a sheet it's better to have circles of the order of let us say 2.5 mm diameter or 2 mm diameter rather than 10 mm diameter okay so because 10 mm diameter itself covers a large region okay 2.5 mm 2 mm would be good so that you can measure strains at a localized locations anyway so now you have to measure epsilon 1 and 2 right epsilon 1 and 2 of the individual deformed grids on the sheet surface are measured near the neck of all the test specimens for the series and it is recorded so uh, we said that this many number of sheets no so 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 all right so these many widths are deformed to get one forming limit curve for one material isn't it so we have to measure epsilon 1 and 2 near the neck in all this seven different strain paths so how do you calculate it you know that epsilon 1 is nothing but ln of l by l not ha uh, ln of l by l not isn't it so ln of l by l not is with respect to this okay ln of l by l not 
okay ln of l by l naught will give you epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 it would be nothing but ln of w by w naught we have already done lot of problems in this we know how to calculate it okay so one can also look into this astm standards Okay, this ASTM standard is the test standard test method for determining forming limit curves. You can look into it. There is a lot of details available in that. So, now when you are measuring this uh, you know, limit strains, you can use a microscope with suitable magnification. Okay. So, and uh, only thing is like now this is a curved bent. This is a bent sheet, isn't it? So, you see that the sheet is actually bent. Okay. The deformation is actually out of plane. This type of test is a deformation is called as out of plane type of deformation. And suppose you want to measure a grid here on the surface. So, what you need to do is you have to you focus your microscope perpendicular to this. You have to see like this. Okay, You have to orient your sheet in that fashion to get the actual dimension rather than the projected ones. Okay, So, you have to use appropriate magnification so that you can see that uh, neck strains uh, properly and uh, you know there are a lot of facilities now you can take uh, you can take photo of a few grids around the neck region and you can process it later also. Okay, And uh, it is also said from the ASTM standard, the epsilon 1 and 2 shall be accurate to about 2.5 percentage strain. Uh, you have to convert in order to put into 100. Uh, to 100, if you put into 100, it will be in percentage. Okay. So, we have to have an accuracy of plus or minus 2.5 percentage strain. Okay. That is what is mentioned in the ASTM standards. Okay. And now, when you are measuring this, uh, you know, uh, strain data points, you have to actually categorize that into three different uh, data points. Okay. One is... Uh, the safe, safe one means no necking, it is safe, it is little away from the neck region, it is little away from the neck region and marginal localized necking, this is what actually we want, marginal ones, marginal one means localized necking very close to the neck which you are going to measure and then fracture region, fracture region means uh, these are uh, regions which are uh, much beyond your localized necking, okay. these three strains have to be separated out clearly this one and this one are pretty very important actually because uh, we have to stop the test we have to measure forming limit chains uh, when it is uh, necking okay so uh, what you do is so you, you have to measure this epsilon 1 and 2 in all that seven different uh, widths for example and you have to categorize that into probably these two important categories safe and marginal so as i showed you before in this particular data point you can say that these red data points are failed and uh, this orange data points I said these are safe right. So, you can say that uh, this instead of failed you can say that these are all uh, localized strains okay marginal ones okay very close to the very close to the forming limit curve very close to the forming limit curve but it is marginal it is just locally necked whereas orange ones are fully safe it will away from the neck region both the strains have to be measured in all the strain parts. And all such data, suppose seven different, uh, you know, betas you have, that means seven different widths you have, okay. Suppose each, in each uh, strain path, each width, you are measuring, let us say, 10 different data points, okay. The 10 different data points, okay, 10 different data points has got uh, 5 plus 5. Let us say 5 in safe and 5 in, let us say, this localized neck, local neck. Okay, 10 different data. So, this 5 plus 5, 10, 10 into 7, 70 data points have to be plotted in one graph, clearly distinguishing between different strain parts and this 5 and this 5. This has to be separately shown. Okay, specifically, the safe and local neck data points 5 plus 5 in each strain path have to be separately shown. Maybe the way I have shown could be one example. So, one is in a red color, other one is in orange color, something like that. Okay. And then what you do is all the data points are coded in FLC as safe and marginal and you have to draw forming limit curve, okay, uh, uh, you know physically you have to draw a forming limit curve, FLC is drawn by drawing a curve, you have to draw a curve on the FLD, okay, you have, you have plotted all the strain values now in the FLD based on the following points. How do you do? Draw a smooth curve above the largest safe epsilon 1 strains. Okay. So, with respect to this diagram, if you see the largest epsilon 1 strain or these are the values, let us say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. These are the largest in epsilon 1 
strains okay you have to draw a curve just above that you have to draw a curve just above that draw a smooth curve e above the largest safe epsilon 1 strains along with associated epsilon 2 strain so you have to draw a curve like that such that all this largest safe strains are below the curve okay it may so happen that some safe no localized necking strain points are intermixed with marginal okay intermixed with marginal localized necking points if that is the case draw flc below this marginal points okay draw flc below this suppose there could be a small there is a small localized uh, you know small band okay where this marginal ones that means your necked ones and safe ones can be intermixed okay they combinedly they are plotted together they are nearby in this diagram forming limit diagram then at that time also you have to be careful that okay then you draw flc below the marginal points that means uh, none of the marginal points should come below the forming limit curve okay otherwise what you need to do is in that particular strain paths you do more tests more trials to get more data so that uh, you can uh, get an accurate uh, distinguished accurate uh, you know better separation between uh, the failed ones and the marginal ones so that's the way you have to draw forming limit curve finally you will see that uh, you will get uh, this particular type of uh, diagram this is called a forming limit diagram these many issues are there when you draw forming limit uh, curve of a material so some uh, important information about your uh, test specimens and grid pattern so what we can do is the longer dimension in the strain paths could be along the rolling direction of the sheet that one can maintain okay and in the lds test whichever we have discussed right now the test specimen shall be sufficiently long to have secure clamping by blank holder and die without excessive pulling that i have already explained you so several sets of test specimens are required to obtain sufficient repeatable accurate data or limit strains so one set of seven sheets may not be sufficient you may have to use the second set or third set also and then you may get 70 into 3 almost uh, about uh, 210 data points okay out of that half of that would be safe half of that would be uh, localized next strains okay this much data if you get you will get a nice continuous accurate it should be repeatable forming limit curve okay so a typical sheet size is given here for example if you use a punch of 100 mm diameter we have used 50 mm 50.8 mm i said isn't it 50.8 isn't it yeah so if you use a, a punch of 100 mm diameter okay i have shown this is radius huh? 50.8 mm radius huh? so if you use 100 mm diameter we will have a sheet which is ending from ranging from 12 mm to 200 mm that means uh, the negative minus strain will have 12 mm width and positive minus strain will be about 200 mm in width at the increments of 25 mm you can say so that many number of widths you can use so you have to cut the sheet before test you have to cut the sheet by shearing machine without any bar okay edge effect is going to be important otherwise it may fail in the gripping region itself you have to be a little bit careful and uh, uh, any unsafe handling is also prevented if you use a, a proper shearing machine and you may have to polish it at the edge before deforming it so edge preparation is actually very very crucial here on the grid patterns okay so let us say this is your sheet this is your sheet okay so this is the best one generally we people use this circle grids okay the circle grids could be connected to each other next to next i just drawn with some gap but otherwise this can be little bit touching each other like this you have to put several grids on the sheet surface 200 mm width and 200 mm length okay you can imagine a square sheet of 200 mm width and 200 mm length right in that you may have to put this all circle grids very close to each other you can imagine this is about 2.5 mm diameter circle grid you can imagine so many circles will come i just show on a schematic here so you can also people use dot pattern instead of circle you can print dots sometimes squares are also used or connected square sometimes a combination can be used ah, so a square and a circle combination also people use it but this is predominantly used and easy to measure also so when you deform a square it becomes some distorted uh, you know dimensions isn't it so whereas uh, the advantage of using a square uh, circle grids is basically it's going to become either circle or an ellipse so it's easy to measure strains but these are all different grids available one can look into ASTM standards for more details this is another you know dimension just i gave you that instead of rectangular samples and square samples sometimes people use this type of samples also uh, the edges are curved in nature this is also ldh sample only but uh, sheet samples 
with a curved edge instead of straight edge. This is also used sometimes. You can see that this is 20 mm width, the negative major strain, and probably uh, your 60 or 80 would have uh, would would give you plain strain type of deformation. 40 and 60 are in between. 120 would give biaxial stretching, and 220 would be your balanced biaxial stretching. You can imagine your 100 mm diameter punch superimposed above this, the top view. How does it look like? Okay. So, and the, some of the deformed sheets are shown here, photographs is shown here, just for your information. And you can see that there is a small neck here, you can see, and you have to measure strain closer to the neck to get the forming limit strain. Okay. So, anyway, let us go ahead, uh, you know, to the other, uh, you know, formability tests in general. Okay. This formability test in general, okay, uh, are classified into two types. One is intrinsic test, other one is simulative test. So, intrinsic tests, okay, there are some categories here, we will discuss one after another, uniaxial tensile test, we know that plane strain tensile test, marciniac stretching, uh, sheet torsion tests are available, hydraulic bulk test, I was introducing that before, Miyochi shear test, hardness tests are also there. Okay. This intrinsic test actually assess the fundamental features of materials that are relevant to their formability. Okay. So, the type of test itself will tell you what is it actually. Okay, these are these are the tests which will give you mostly your um, you know type of like stress strain behavior, your forming limit like that, which are actually material property type. Simulative test in simulations, the material is subject to deformation that closely approaches distortion that would occur during any certain forming procedure. Say, for example, you have bending, stretching, drawing, stretch drawing. These are all some tests which are of simulative nature. So you want to simulate this type of actual deformation at lab scale. So how do you do that test? So, bending is a separate test, stretching, separate one, deep drawing or draw, cup drawing, separate one. You want to combine stretching and drawing as stretch draw test, another one. Uh, buckling tests are available, we will see some example. These are all other tests available. So, we will see one by one. Intrinsic test, uh, the first one is, uh, uh, you know, you know that very well. We already discussed this, uniaxial tension test. So, we have also discussed that uh, you can follow ASTM E8 standard. So, gauge length is generally 50.8 mm generally 50 mm we say gauge length and 12.5 mm wide or 12 mm wide you can say 12.5 mm 12.7 mm you can say so this is a standard dimension okay so uh, gauge length is should be known to us and uh, width also should be known to us and then what do you do you give displacement on one direction okay this initial thickness we all studied this and then the ultimate aim of this tensile test is to test it until the material fails fully and then the machine is going to give you load displacement graph. Okay. So, um, so for that you are going to use load cell and extensometer, strain gauge extensometer. So, uh, from the load displacement graph you can get engineering sustain graph, we say SE. Okay. And from SE you can get a two stress strain graph using standard procedure that we already know. Okay. And uh, from this, we know how to calculate all the properties. Okay, I just summarized here. Okay, what all the properties you can get? So, sample preparation, uh, as we discussed before, the so sample preparation is very very important here also. Okay, the uh, sharp uh, corner should be avoided. You can see that. Okay, this type of radius have to be maintained, and the sheared edge should not have any burr. It should be smooth. Otherwise, uh, that will act as a notch, and uh, maybe it can fail here itself instead of having failure here. So, it can fail here. Actually, we want failure here, okay, which is unwanted. This should be avoided. So, you have to prepare sample properly for that edge preparation is very much required. Okay, And uh, you also know that uh, the specimen alignment should be good in the machine. Uh, so, the center line of the grips, you have to be careful. Okay, And the load is measured using load cell and you may have to use extensometer for some time to get the uh, strains in the uh, gauge region. And uh, sometimes uh, we may need to measure, uh, you know, uh, thickness and width of the sample for, uh, um, you know, some details. Say, for example, you want to get R value, strain, uh, plastic strain ratio, let us say capital R, true width strain divided by true thickness strain, right? So, in that case, uh, your uh, width strain have to be measured and thickness strain have to be measured. Accordingly, you may have to test the sample. So, gauge region is the only main region that 50.8 mm, 50 mm, we say gauge region is the main region which will undergo a predominant plastic deformation and after some time you will see that uh, the other region even may not deform also. Generally, uh, rate of testing is maintained at uh, cross at speed of 1 mm per minute. You can convert this into, this is V, 
Uh, this is V. V is 1 mm per minute, you can say. Okay, and you have a gauge length. Okay, or we can say V by L. Uh, we say maybe 50 mm. Right, so you can get a strain rate from this. Yesterday we discussed, no, it is nothing but V by L. So you can get a strain rate per second from this. You can convert this. Otherwise, I have mentioned the cross head speed is of the order of 1 mm per minute. Okay, so these are the properties you can get. Young's modulus, you know how to get it. It's a slope of the elastic part. So you have to be careful in measuring the uh, load and uh, displacement or strain in the elastic portion because it's going to be very small in, in, in a tensile, full tensile test. Yield strength, we know how to get. Uh, we use uh, proof stress procedure. We already explained it. Tensile strength, there is nothing but uh, the highest stress in the engineering stress strain curve. Uniform elongation is nothing but uh, uh, your uh, maybe engineering strain at the maximum stress. You can convert that into two strain also, right? Total elongation is a point, the elongation at fracture. So you can also convert this into epsilon t, true strain values after getting et. N value, you know how to get it. It's basically in the strain hardening region. Uh, you convert that sigma epsilon into ln of sigma and ln of epsilon plot. The slope is going to give you n. So n is nothing but d ln of sigma divided by d ln of epsilon. So, from that you can get uh, the strain hardening exponent. These all are known to us and uh, in one way this tensile test is also going to tell you about formability of the sheet. So that is why epsilon u and epsilon t are going to be important. Epsilon t minus epsilon u which is actually connected to m value is also important for us, is not it? These all are related to a simple uh, you know test used to evaluate formability of any material. Plastic strain ratio, you know how to get it. Plastic strain ratio is nothing but uh, how is the definition? Definition I suggested epsilon true width strain divided by true thickness strain. For this, uh, a separate test is there. This is one of the uh, you know test procedure which I have given here. Okay, this is the ASTM E five one seven standard. You can refer to. This is a simple test again. So you have a rectangular sheet of uh, let us say length. Uh, length is one seventy five mm. You can see. Okay, and uh, uh, you have. Uh, this width, total width C as about, uh, you know, 28.58 mm. It is both are given. And thickness, whatever thickness you have, small t, whatever thickness you have in the material, you have to take it. And what you do is, you put four indents here, one, two, three, four, four indents, uh, spacing with respect to W and G. So, W is nothing but 20 mm and G is also about 20 mm. So, this is 20 mm, this is 20 mm. You have to put this indents. And then what you do is, uh, you deform the sheet up to let us say 20 percent of this length of this g 20 percent of this g okay 20 percent of the g which means g will become about let us say 25 mm 20 mm would become about 25 mm so your uh, g is known let us say g naught is the new one okay F for uh, g naught you will have w naught so w would become w naught so t would become t uh, your uh, t would become okay i will say g i W i T i instantaneous. So, ln of G i by G, ln of W i by W, ln of T i by T would give you three different strains and you can use uh, this ratio to get the uh, R value of that particular material. So, small t you can use. So, but uh, one thing which you need to know about is the standard dimensions. So, uh, your uh, C is uh, 28.58 and this is uh, 175. In between you have to put a uh, uh, gauge width and length as a 20 mm and 20 mm. Okay, you can see the accuracy levels also given here. So, this is the way you can get plastic strain ratio which is also in a way related to your formability of sheet. Strain rate sensitivity index. Huh? So, this is also known to us. We have also uh, discussed this briefly in the previous section only we discussed how M affects the nicking uh, behavior and we have related it also. And then M can be calculated using this particular equation. M is nothing but ln of sigma 1 by 2 divided by ln of epsilon 1 dot divided by epsilon 2 dot. And there, there are two different tests that people do. Either they use a, a duplicate test or change in rate methods. Change in changing rate methods. Duplicate test is basically you do tensile test at two different strain rates. Epsilon 1 dot and 2 dot. And use this equation to get M. Otherwise, what you can do is you can do changing rate method. In one test itself, you can change the uh, you know uh, strain rate. For example, you keep on testing it. It is deformed up to epsilon 1 dot. Then suddenly go to epsilon 2 dot. Deform it. Come back to 1 dot. Go to 2 dot. Come back to 1 dot. Go to 2 dot. Okay. This delta sigma is the rise in sigma because you are changing the strain rate from 1 dot to 2 dot. 
okay and uh, according to this formula you can get m value and we also just related epsilon t minus epsilon u to m value isn't it okay so now uh, this uniaxial tensile test whatever we have seen okay though it is good but it is going to give you negative minus strain or width strain okay it's going to give you negative minus strain or width strain that means if you put a circle grid on the just at the geometric center of the sample okay you will see that uh, your uh, length is anyway going to increase uh, and width is going to be negative so it's going to give you negative minus strain okay but uh, this test is not going to offer any insight during plane strain actually what happens where the minus strain is zero so you want a test sample okay which can deform which can be done in a utm only but at the same time you need to have a plane strain mode of deformation not any axial then this type of sample dimensions can be used so this sample is little uh, a little complex as compared to any axial you can see it's a pretty uh, a broad a wide sample you can see this a okay is of the order of 254 mm this b uh, this uh, center you can say gauge width may be b as 165 mm and this uh, C as about 38 mm and this radius is about 41.5 mm, okay. Increasing the width of the sample, uh, increasing the width of the sample and decreasing the gauge length changes the strain state to, state to plane strain, okay. So, this dimension sheet can be fabricated, maybe using your uh, wire EDM or any other method and this region can be held in the machine, okay. And uh, you can pull it by giving some displacement. Okay, and you will see that naturally this is a weaker portion, your B region is a weaker portion and it is going to fail there and one can put lot of circles on the sheet surface, okay. So, you can get, uh, you know, failed strains by measuring epsilon 1 and 2 wherever necking is going to happen. One can also get low displacement graph for this particular test. That is one way. The other way is sometimes what people do is they constrain the width, they constrain width by putting some bead. Okay, so they constrain the width by putting some bead in the width direction so that okay only the center region is going to deform that is in plane strain that will be in plane strain that is also people use which I have not shown here. The width constraint method involves employing a rectangular sample with circular notches leading to a center gauge region okay that is narrowed in width. The gauge section is secured between two sets of opposing parallel knife edges. Knife edges means uh, uh, something which is actually restricting the movement of material in that direction, okay, like a bead, okay, like a draw bead, okay, they are called as uh, stingers which are aligned parallel to a sample axis and you deform it, the other portion, center portion may undergo plane strain mode of deformation, but this is simple to use, this particular one. This is called plane strain tension testing. So, the main difference between the previous one and this one is, in this case you can maintain beta is equal to 0, in the previous case uh, your beta would be something relevant to uniaxial tensile test which you already discussed several times. So, if you get a forming limit strain from this, it will reach your forming limit curve, let us say epsilon 1, 2 in this data point. Suppose this is your forming limit curve, if you use this particular test, it will grow across along this line and it will reach a forming limit curve here, rather uniaxial will be on this side, uniaxial will be on this side. So, biaxial tensile uh, stretch testing, this is another uh, you know testing procedure Okay, uh, this is also called as uh, uh, you know Marciniak biaxial stretching and uh, hydraulic bulge test. There are two different types of tests. Okay, and these tests are important because uh, your limit dome height test or hemispherical punch test, which we said, these actually the limit strains uh, are dependent on the friction interface friction because your punch and sheet are in contact. Okay, where fracture is going to happen. So. Uh, there could be a chance that your friction interface friction may affect it. Okay, so to avoid it, you are going to use two important uh, methods. One is Marciniak biaxial stretching test, other one is hydraulic bulge test. So your Marciniak biaxial stretching is explained here with the schematic. Uh, there are some intricate details here. If you see, so this is your punch. Okay, this is your punch. The punch is actually cylindrical in nature, but if you see at the at its end, there is a small upward indent. Okay. Actually, it's, it should be flat like this, your punch has to be flat like this, instead of that, basically there is a small indent like this, there is a small indent like this, okay, there is a small indent like this, you can see this, 
this region I am saying small indent here. So, which means that the punch is not going to touch the sheet in the center location. Okay. So, otherwise what you have here is uh, you have a blank holder which is going to hold the sheet and you have a die on which your sheet is kept. Now, there is one more point here other than sheet. Okay. You are this part actually this part is actually sheet. Okay. Below sheet that means between the sheet and the punch. Okay. There is a another sheet with a hole here. There is another sheet with a hole at the center you can see. Okay. This is called a spacer. Sometimes it is called as washer also. It is called as washer. Okay. So, this uh, spacer or washer is kept between this particular punch and the actual sheet for which you have to get the forming limit. Okay. And uh, this spacer has got a hole at the center and the spacer generally is same material as that of your actual sheet. Okay. So, there are a lot of details I have given here. Okay. So, now what do you do that uh, basically the punch touches the sheet the initial contact position and then you push punch down. So, punch is actually displaced okay, and it will deform the sheet in this fashion and the main issue here is you will see that uh, we expect fracture to happen in this location of the sheet. Here only you want fracture to happen on the sheet and uh, if a fracture happens here of course, you have to put circle grids on the sheet surface to get the forming limit chains like we defined before okay. and uh, if you see fracture here and if you measure forming limit strain you will see that. Uh, this particular zone where fracture happens does not have any contact with punch at the same time it does not bend also. At the same time it does not bend because this is in one plane. You can see that your sheet is actually deformed below the hole in one plane. Suppose this is your hole, this is your hole, huh? your sheet is actually going to fail in this region. Okay, F yeah, sheet is going to fail in this region only. Okay. So, this region is actually has got no contact because there is a hole here and the punch is actually not contacting in this region at all. So, which means that there is no interface friction at the same time the fracture happens in the flat location which is not bending. Okay. So, that is the main advantage of this uh, Marciniak biaxial stretch test, but uh, the problem here is uh, your hole preparation has to be properly done, edge preparation of this hole has to be properly done and the size of the hole is also very important. Okay. And, uh, your hole should not crack before the sheet fails. Okay. So, there are certain important things that you have to do. So, you have to do a lot of test to evaluate this particular forming limit. So, otherwise what you do is in this test also I will show you in the next module uh, some dimensions of the sheet that we use for this particular test. You will see that there also you have several series of tests that you have to do for getting forming limit curve of one particular sheet. Next one is hydraulic bulge test. Hydraulic bulge test is again like uh, you know uh, you use uh, hydraulic fluid okay, to pressurize the sheet like this and then it will deform in the fashion of in, in, like a dome. Okay. So, now here there is no contact between the punch and the sheet because punch does not exist at all. So, whatever forming limit strains you are going to have from this is going to be independent of uh, friction. The sheet metal is clamped by die rings. Die rings means nothing but a blank holder with a draw bead and the hydraulic pressure is applied from one side to deform the sample into a dome shape into a dome shape. So, to prevent slippage at the end of the sample log bead is used. Okay. So, you can use log bead. So, uh, at the different stages you can evaluate its curvature or uh, you know extension at any location you want and a fluid pressure because you are the one we are going to control it and uh, this type of simple relationship we already know from solid mechanics point of view in this case radial stress sigma is nothing but PR by 2T where P is a hydraulic pressure you have and R is the radius of curvature and T is the uh, you know sheet thickness okay one can relate like this and uh, the thing is like uh, this particular test can also be used along with uniaxial tensile test to characterize the stress strain behavior you can also get stress strain behavior let us say for example this particular location okay this particular the nose of the dome or the topmost position in the dome this particular location you want the stress strain behavior you can get it and you can plot a graph like uh, what you say here like your uniaxial tensile test graph you can draw okay so that you can get the uh, you can characterize the materials behavior in biaxial mode of deformation okay so here actually uh, you know you have to clamp the sheet fully so which means that you may have to use only the rightmost uh, you know dimension of the sheet that is uh, you are the one which gives you 
uh, beta is equal to 1 balanced by axial stretching which means that you can get a sustained behavior when beta is equal to 1 that type of situation you can get okay like plain strain mode of deformation we can get uh, beta is equal to 0 that sustained behavior similarly in this type of test you can get beta is equal to 1 type of deformation you can uh, it can prevail in the sheet deformation somewhere in this uppermost position and when it deforms and uh, when it fails you can get uh, stress strain graph also and of course you can also get forming limit strains whenever it next so this can be used to characterize the biaxial deformation mode of the sheet okay so these are two tests in parallel with limit dome height test you can use but uh, independent of uh, friction now this uh, shear testing is another uh, method okay i have just given you the schematic here uh, this is also a little uh, complex in doing the test okay here what you do is uh, so there is a this is a sheet actually of a 50 mm dimension it's a square sheet you can say okay and uh, you can say that there is an outer clamped zone red color one and there's an inner clamped zone green color one okay so this particular test is actually called as marcinia in plane sheet torsion test in plane means on the plane of the sheet okay uh, sheet torsion test some things that's, that means there is some sort of rotary motion is given to the sheet and you are going to evaluate that uh, the you know the plane or shear deformation okay that's going on in the sheet that's what you are going to evaluate so how are we going to do that you see that a square sample measuring 50 mm on each side is effectively positioned on into three distinct zones an internally clamped circular zone an intermediate ring shaped zone free to deform that means between this red and the green this is free to deform that's a shear zone and externally clamped outside ring shaped zone okay that means you are these two zones okay green yellow and red as yellow region is the one which is going to undergo is free to undergo some deformation the inner zone undergoes rotation with its plane in relationship to the outer zone okay induced shear deformation in the intermediate zone so the inner zone is actually rotated okay somehow you have to hold it and rotate it with respect to the outer zone which means that uh, the transit zone that is your shear zone will have uh, okay uh, you know shear deformation in it the sample is deformed until fracture occurs and the angular rotations at two specific radii within the intermediate zone are gauged using the calibrated drums and move in tandem with the sheet. So you have to basically measure the rotation and you can get the angular strain or shear strain you can say and you can see that the shear stress tau can be related to shear strain by some material constants C and uh, hardening power M. Sigma is equal to K epsilon power N E X L 10 similarly here also you can have tau is equal to c gamma power n you can say okay this is one test there is another test called as miao chi shear test which is little easy for us to do okay so this is in plane type this is also in plane but this can be done in a utm like this okay so initial sample dimensions are given you can see okay so the sheet metals undergo planar shear deformation through a modified tension technique okay what do you do here you have rectangular samples with flat surface okay are employed with the ends divided into three equal sections by slits so three equal sections means one two three these three sections are there at the edge okay closer to the edge and uh, two slits actually separate this so what do you do here is you actually pull the outside two uh, sections with respect to the inner section like this these two sections are pulled in this way this section is pulled in this fashion by using an utm Okay, in opposite directions you can do. So this particular action generates shear stress within the region situation between the inner and outer section. Somewhere here, it is going to provide some sort of shear deformation. Okay, and uh, you know one can get uh, uh, some characteristics, shear characteristics, in plane shear characteristics of that particular sheet material using this test. Okay, so uh, this is another test that people use for shear testing. There are several other methods also, but. Uh, this are a little bit more complex. These are a little easy to understand. Hardness test is another uh, you know important test. A hardness test means a conventional hardness test only that we uh, generally use for any material, uh, any uh, testing. But so for sheets also you can use. So but uh, uh, the thing is like how do you connect it to formability? Uh, that correlation is actually little. Uh, one has to one little bit cautious. Okay, the measure of formability has often been assessed through hardness which quantifies the resistance to indentation caused by a concentrated load applied by suitable indenter. We know that. Hardness is nothing but resistance to indentation. And you know the procedure, Brinell hardness, Vickers hardness, 
So there are a few more hardness tests also. So, but how do you correlate with formability? We say that decreasing formability with increasing hardness. Okay, increasing hardness also means that the material strength would be increasing. So, which will be connected to formability with a decreasing formability. However, this particular correlation generally people say it is unreliable. Okay, but the test is useful to ensure the material grade has got required strength for a particular component making. That much one can understand from this. Okay, like your yield strength and UTS is also important for you to guess. Okay, whether the material is suitable for a particular application, this hardness is also important to check whether the material has got a particular strength level to make a particular component. Otherwise, it is a correlation the formability is little, uh, we have to be little bit careful. Let us go to simulative tests. There are some 4 or 5 tests in this category also which are simple to uh, implement in lab scale. Okay. So, first one is basically bending test. Okay. First one is basically bending test. There are two categories in this. One is a simple bending test, other one is stretch bending test. Okay. So, stretch bending test is also simple only, but you need some tools for that. Okay. Whereas, the simple bending is as the name suggests, it is simple bending. Okay. So, what do you do in simple bending? So, you can simply do it in your workshop. So, you have bench wise in that uh, you have to keep a bending die like this. Let us say this fellow is a bending die and you have to hold your original sample here, sheet sample and then what do you do? You have to apply some displacement in this direction okay? and the sheet is bent. The sheet is bent like this. So, this is your original sample and the new sample is uh, bent like this. New sample would be like this. So, it is bent. Okay. So, either you can do this uh, manually or you can also clamp this in a UTM okay? and then you can apply uh, displacement to it okay, to bend it, both are possible. Okay. Uh, so, basically the idea here is whether you can bend the sheet to 180 degrees without fracture or crack on the tensile side. Okay. So, here the material should not, in this location the material should not fracture or neck when you deform it to 90 degrees like this. Okay. This is one stage, this is another stage. So, and then you can further deform it to 180 degree. So, 180 degree means something like hemming operation you can say, something like a hemming operation you can say, that type of deformation you can see to check whether the material is actually going to fail here in this region or not. Okay. So, if it is done then one can you know repeat the experiment for smaller radius in the die. So, this, this radius no, this region could be further uh, it could be a little bit more, uh, you know, smaller radius, okay, very uh, sharp corners maybe, a blunt uh, bent die or sharp bent die, both can be used to check whether, you know, uh, the material can be deformed or uh, it can be bent to 180 degrees using that particular die, okay. But different materials like you can go for high strength steels or aluminum alloys or other steel to check whether uh, uh, different die radius can be accommodated for that bending, okay. So, uh, if you want to mitigate crack during uh, your hemming operations, okay. So, like this hemming operations are used to, uh, to mechanically clamp two different sheets when you make a component, is not it? Suppose you want to make a soft drink scan, okay. You can also check, okay, that at the edges, uh, the two materials are actually hemmed, okay. So, you will see that uh, this type of bending characterization is important for that particular material. So, this is simple bending which you can implement where only moment is given. Okay, you are going to give only moment to this. So, you want to give moment along with tension. So, you can call that a stretch bend test. Stretch bend test look like this. Okay. So, here you can see that uh, there is a punch. Okay. I have shown a, a V-shaped uh, corner punch, wedge like wedge, wedge shaped corner. You can say like a wedge shape corner. So, you know like uh, angular punch you can say uh, of a particular angle is maintained here. And you can see that sheet is clamped in the blank holder on the die with a draw bead so that it does not move in. And then you just push the punch inside the workpiece so that the workpiece bends like this. At the same time, a tension is generated in the unsupported region. Tension is generated in the unsupported region because you are clamping it. Because you are clamping it. So that is why we call it as a stretch bend test. So a rectangular strip of sheet metal is securely, securely uh, held uh, using lock beads. Okay. So, it is deformed uh, as shown in the figure using a punch. So, when you do this, there are two type of punch, uh, you know, one can use. One is a hemispherical test, you say, in which a punch is of hemispherical tip. 
and a concentric circular log bead is used. Otherwise, you can use angular test where wedge shaped punch and straight parallel log beads can be used. Okay. So, in hemispherical punch, one advantage is you can have variety of strain states like the way we have seen before, but in angular punch, you can have plain strain state. Angular punch means wedge shaped punch and straight parallel log beads. A plain strain state means it will be created by angular punch okay, perpendicular to the a plane of this diagram. So, perpendicular to the plane, you can see that you can have plain strain mode of deformation. Okay. So, along the bend and in through thickness direction, you may have some strain, but you know perpendicular to this, uh, you know uh, the sheet or the plane of this diagram, you can have a plane strain. So, that can be used and fracture whether it is going to happen or not will be tested. So, the advantage, uh, the difference between the previous one and this one is uh, here the sheet is actually clamped and then bent. So, it is actually stretch bending test. The previous one is just bending only uh, no stretching only bending is provided. So, this is bend test. There are some stretching tests available. So, what are the stretching tests? One is a simple lap scale ball punch test. Okay, ball punch test. This ball punch test we can categorize into Olsen test and Erickson cup test. The Erickson cup test is very famous. Okay, so, we can it is a commercially available test. We can implement it in lap scale uh, tabletop and then we can show demonstrate. Okay. Uh, how formability changes for different materials. Olson test is also similar one, only a difference is going to be the test dimensions, sample uh, your uh, tool dimensions. Olson test you can check, uh, it is going to use 22.2 mm diameter hardened steel ball like this. Okay. This hardened steel ball is let us say attached to a punch. And then you can see all the standard setups are available. You have die, holder, everything. The material is clamped and it is going to push the sheet and the sheet is going to bulge like this. Okay. Dimensions are given here, the gap dimensions. So, you can use a 22.2 mm diameter hardened steel ball and a die with a 25.4 mm inner diameter okay, and about a 0.8 mm die profile radius you can use. Okay. And uh, here main aim is you keep on deform, pushing the ball inside the a sheet until fracture. So, this height, okay, the sheet is going to bulge like this, is not it? So, this forming height is of important to us, this forming height is of important to us. So, let us say fracture occurs here, okay, this forming height is of important to us and we can characterize, we can compare different uh, materials, okay. Instead of going for a lot of calculations like forming limit curve like that, but this test is very simple to Understand. Erickson capture is a similar one where you use a 20 mm diameter ball and die with 27 mm inner diameter and 0.75 mm die profile radius. So, evaluation of stretchability, how do you do? This cup height or uh, this dome height and the maximum load at the point of fracture or measure. So, if you can install this in UTM, if you fabricate, you can also get load versus displacement graph. Okay. So, you can get P max, which is nothing but your maximum load. Okay. So, this height H and P max are measures of formability. It is easy to evaluated. So, hemispherical dome test, LDH test, this we already discussed, okay, little uh, more uh, more details if you want, okay. So, then what you do is uh, you can have bigger samples, bigger dimensions in tool which uh, is going to simulate what you actually see in industry level components. Uh, that level if you want to get more details then uh, hemispherical dome test and LDH test can be used and uh, in this test also you can forming height is important, ah, same way. Like for example, if you see fracture here, this height, this forming height is of important to us and for this test also, if you install it in UTM, you can get load displacement graph okay. and this peak load okay, is an indication of uh, your uh, instability in the material and this the displacement would be nothing but this height only okay, where uh, this, this data is also going to be important for us, one can get. Of course, other than that, you can get a epsilon 1 star and epsilon 2 star without nothing but forming limit strains and by changing the width of the sheet, you can get forming limit curve. These are all three, load displacement graph, the forming height and limit strains, all three can be obtained from this test. We already explained it, so okay. There is another important stretching test called OSU formability test, okay. OSU formability test, OSU uh, is for Ohio State University and it is introduced there. So, it is called as OSU 
formability test. It is called in short, it is called as OSU FT, you can say. OSU FT. So, here the advantage is you can get forming limit strain okay, in plain strain mode of deformation. In plain strain mode of deformation, but sheet is going to deform in out of plane. Okay. Previously, we have seen plain strain tension test, but that is like a ten, like a uniaxial tensile test. Here, the sheet is going to deform in one plane, in vertical plane, right? So, but in this particular test, the tools are fabricated in such a way, dimensions are fixed in such a way that you can deform the sheet like your limit dome height test, but the advantage is here your formability will be evaluated in plain strain mode of deformation. Okay, so, you may get epsilon 1 star and 2 star that means forming limit strain only in plain strain mode. Okay. So, this test is developed mainly to avoid certain demerits in limit dome height test where it is found that in limit dome height test repeatability is going to be a problem. Okay, specifically in uh, you know the limit strains are when they are conservative in nature like in plain strain mode of deformation it is difficult to repeat the data. So, though it is a standard test. So, it has got that particular problem then uh, this one was developed where sheet is deformed only in plain strain mode of deformation and you can see the uh, you know the sheet how it is deformed okay and uh, tool sheet arrangement you can see. So, you can see that sheet is clamped here and you can see that uh, the sheet is actually deformed in this fashion okay. So, it is a plain strain okay in this fashion you can see that uh, it is about 124 mm length. Uh, and uh, the draw bead to draw bead is about 65.3 and it is about 101.6 width. Okay. The methodology employs a punch and dies equipped with a log bead to systematically stretch a broad blank until fracture happens. So, you have to have fracture in the sheet. The test is easy. Okay. The test is uh, easy and straightforward execution needs only a single specimen width to achieve a plain strain failure. Okay. So, instead of deforming several uh, you know strain parts, the most critical one plane strain one plane strain deformation if you can get limit strain that will be good okay and it is easy to do this uh, in lab scale and you can characterize the forming limit strain in plane strain mode of deformation only with uh, one sample dimension so throughout the uh, test if you see the strain path uh, is maintained in near plane strain or on plane strain enhancing the test consistency when compared to the ldh test so that is the advantage here okay so this is called uh, OSU formability test. In stretching test, there is one more important test called hole expansion test. This hole expansion test will tell you uh, about the sheet material during hole expansion. So, for example, here you will see that this is a flat bottomed punch. As usual, the sheet is clamped between die and the blank holder and you will see the sheet, initial sheet, flat sheet has got a hole. Flat sheet has got a hole here. And then you deform this using this particular type of punch or sometimes we can also use a spherical punch or conical punch also okay and uh, when you do this what will happen is the edge region is going to be little uh, you know prone to uh, your crack and it may fail in the edge region so if you see from the top view if you see from the top view it's a sheet like this okay and there is a hole here and you are going to deform the sheet and you are going to stretch the hole okay so hole can crack anywhere in this location depending on its weakness Okay. So, if you want to evaluate the whole stretchability of any material which is also an indication of in a way formability you can use this test and whole expansion percentage is defined by d f minus d naught by d naught into 100 where d f d naught and d f are the initial and final hole diameters. So, initial hole diameter you know what is it let us say d naught you measure it and keep it inside and then uh, you keep on deforming it and just stop at which a crack occurs in the edge take it out and measure the diameter you will get a whole expansion how much is the percentage okay this is also stretching this is all basically involves a stretching component in the material to characterize its formability now let us go to drawing test only drawing is involved okay like for example deep drawing so deep drawing test so simple examples i have shown here swift cup test okay swift cup test is used to evaluate drawability of a material and uh, you can see some typical uh, you know tool dimensions given you can see standard punch is available it is a flat bottom punch and the sheet is clamped between the die and the blank holder but there is no draw bead here you can see that. So, when the punch moves in this direction if you give some displacement this movement is allowed this movement is allowed so that the flange region this is a flange region is going to become a cup wall region 
is going to become a cup wall region. So you have flange, you have cup wall and you have cup bottom. We have seen this diagram uh, with the sheet as an example before also. And you can see uh, the punch is about 50 mm and you can see the die inner opening is about 52.5 mm, uh, only 2.5 mm gap you can see and this radius is about 6.36 uh, mm. So what you do here is this particular test is used to evaluate LDR. LDR is nothing but limiting draw ratio. Okay, draw ratio we already seen. Draw ratio is nothing but uh, your sheet diameter, initial sheet diameter to punch diameter. Punch diameter is constant. Okay, so you can change the initial sheet diameter within a range. Okay, and there will be one particular diameter at which you can get a very nice uh, uh, cup without any defect. So you call that as a limiting draw ratio. We say maximum blank diameter divided by punch diameter, which is nothing but d by d. Okay, d by d. That is one quantity which you can evaluate. You can also evaluate percentage reduction. Okay, you can also evaluate percentage reduction. Percentage reduction means like in extrusion, wire drawing also you use this. Okay, percentage reduction means it is d minus d divided by d into 100. How severe is your uh, deformation? Okay, so how big is your d and how much you are going to push it inside this gap? Okay, that is decided by d minus d by d into 100. You can also get cup height from this by equating the initial sheet volume to the new volume. You can, if you can do that, then you will get uh, this type of relations also you can get. So, uh, this limiting draw ratio is influenced by normal anisotropy and uh, you know sheet thickness. We will see some details later. But when you do this uh, deep drawing test, you need to be careful about the blank holding force. Okay, Too low blank holding force will create a wrinkling in the flange region because of your in-plane compression. Okay, In-plane compression. And too high value can create fracture in the punch profile corner. In the punch profile corner itself, it will fail before you form a cup. Okay, so the die ring should be greased properly, but a punch should not be the amount of stretching that happens over the punch profile radius and the potential of splitting to occur in this area are minimized by not lubricating the punch. So you have to be careful when you use a lubricant also. So this is a drawing test or deep drawing test. You can say swift cup test. Okay, so now you can have both stretching and drawing in uh, the same test. There are two important tests. Okay, one is uh, you can call it as a fukai conical cup test, the other one is a swift round bottom cup test. In these two tests, if you see, stretching and drawing both will be there. So using a simple setup we can do, I have just drawn one schematic here. Okay, So you can see that uh, uh, the sheet is clamped and there is a ball in under which will come and deform the sheet. So you will see that uh, the sheet will be deformed in a conical fashion in the wall region. At the same time, this ball in under will give you a shape at the tip and it can fracture here. You can see this is the initial one, initial workpiece. This red one is a deformed workpiece. The red one is a deformed workpiece. You can see that there is a fracture here. Okay, and you can see it is actually conical part, which is actually sort of drawing in. And then at the edge, it is in the corner or in the, the uppermost portion, it is going to stretch where fracture is going to happen. Because the punch top is semispherical, the specimen is stretched in the middle in addition to the flange being drawn in to create a cup wall. This is what I was telling you. The end point of the test determined by observing fracture here. I have shown you here. Huh? So, this is it will be like this. Your deformed sheet will be like this. So, you will go like this and you will see some fracture here. Something like this. So, this is an indication of a limit of a formability. So, if you can do it in UTM, you can say drop in, uh, you know, punch load, which is going to be indication of a fracture. So, both uh, you are uh, stretching and uh, drawing involved in this. So, this can be categorized under stretch drawing test. Your Fukui conical cup test is also like that. Okay. So, only thing is like uh, the dimensions are slightly different. The details are given here using 12.5 to 27 mm diameter ball. You can use it. Okay. So, diameter of the base of the conical cup is measured and divided by the diameter of the original specimen to give the Foucault conical cup value. Okay. And uh, the sponge travel at the onset of visible neck, okay, which means that you get a load displacement graph. Okay. Suppose you see this load, this displacement height or punch travel is also could be one parameter which you can measure. 
wrinkling and buckling test these are the, these are the last two tests and then we will stop here okay so what you do here is uh, you are you are going to use this type of uh, setup the setup is actually known to us so you have a punch like this and you have a die holder and it is actually held here and you will see that uh, this punch is actually dimension is made such that it is uh, much smaller than the die opening so that uh, this wall region is little of conical in shape it is not straight like what you see here it is not uh, straight like what you see here you can see it is straight wall is cup wall is straight here instead of that you reduce the diameter of the punch such that you can have a unsupported region here which is of this particular conical shape as a result the cup wall is conical and does not come in touch with the punch it's basically a unsupported region so you can see that the flat bottomed punch with the diameter equal to 75 percentage of the inner diameter of the die deform the circular bank so you can calculate accordingly okay so 0.75 into your inner diameter of this die is equal to the uh, punch diameter you can imagine like that so what you do here is uh, that is another important point so you can also change the blank holding force okay and check what is actually happening in the wall region okay so you can see that i have drawn a graph schematic forming height in y axis bhf in x axis and there are actually three profiles here one is the red one corresponding to flange wrinkling okay flange wrinkling is this part flange is this that wrinkling we know already then you can also have wall wrinkling okay wall wrinkling means this unsupported conical region can also wrinkle okay and then there could be a fracture zone okay so you will see that at a lower blank holding force if you keep okay so uh, there will be flange wrinkling that we already know okay that's why in the previous deep drawing case we said there has to be an appropriate uh, blank holding force otherwise wrinkling will happen so if you increase the blank holding force beyond that you may have wall wrinkling wall wrinkling means here okay in the in the in the, in the conical region okay in the unsupported region it can wrinkle but if you increase the blank holding force it may lead to fracture also so you can get this type of profile and you will see that uh, the forming height is going to be maximum where these two intersect the wall wrinkling and fracture limits meet at the intersection of maximum cup height okay so one can characterize the formability in this fashion so the maximum height is reached when this wall wrinkling profile and fracture levels actually come closer to each other that is why you have h max this can be characterized using this type of uh, test this test uh, is actually called as yoshida buckling test okay yoshida buckling test here you will see that uh, you have a flat square specimen okay the specimen is of 100 mm side you can see here in this diagram and uh, this actual uh, sample is actually clamped in the corner in the corner region for about 41 mm width it is actually clamped and you are actually pulling it okay and you are actually pulling it gauge region is maintained about uh, you can say like point to point is about 75 mm okay and uh, inside this 75 mm there could be one particular location of 25.4 mm you know width okay there you will have buckle this kind of buckling can happen you can see that aa cross section aa if you section it and see you may have a buckle like this so you are going to pull in this direction to create this buckle in the aa cross section within this small gauge region a buckle develops in its center along the path of loading indicator of buckling is the height of the buckle at a specific elongation like uh, let us say about 2 percentage so you pull it to about 2 or 3 percentage and you will have a this kind of buckling height so that can characterize the buckling feature of this particular uh, sheet whatever sheet you are going to deform this is another way this is one way to characterize the buckling nature of a sheet but the problem is this material should not fail before you reach this buckling okay that is why you will see that uh, low formable materials like aluminum alloys will have a difficulty in completing this test because the specimen fracture before buckling that should not happen otherwise uh, probably you may have to reduce this percentage to characterize the buckling or if buckling is not happened fracture happens before then you cannot test that material using this so for example aluminum will have this problem so this many number of tests are available for us to uh, characterize the formability of sheet or to characterize the uh, deep drawability uh, to characterize the uh, uh, hole stretching 
uh, to characterize uh, uh, you know the uh, drawing come stretching ability of material in one test okay and uh, to characterize the shear deformation shear formability of the material you can also characterize this kind of buckling you can also characterize the uh, limit of wrinkling okay so all this can be characterized using different types of tests complexities change some need tools like punch your die holder and blank holder uh, like that some are actually can be done in utm itself okay so depending on the case the complexity changes but these many tests are available to characterize the formability of sheet and this particular one we will stop it here mm -hmm.